financial independence, country shopping, van nomadism, security culture, ethical enclaves, crypto anarchy, legal interstices, survivalism. Join your host Shane and Kyle as they explore this freedom strategy known as Vaughn. You're listening to the Vani Podcast. And welcome to the Vani Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to coercion. I'm Shane and... I'm Jason. Since governments are the primary coercers upon individuals, this podcast and everything found on the website, unless otherwise noted, is covered by a BIPCOT, no government license. This allows reuse and modification to anyone except for governments and the bludgies thereof. Uh, so Kyle is still not back with me, so I've decided to welcome back, you know, welcome our first returning guest co-host uh, back to the podcast, uh, Jason Booth. Uh, so thanks so much for joining me again, man. Uh, how are you doing? You know, I'm doing not too bad, Shane. How are you doing this afternoon, evening, where you are? Yeah, evening, evening. But uh, you know, can't complain. Things are uh, things are things are going pretty good. So uh, so so yeah, I guess uh, I guess that's a good thing. Um, so I guess so, Jason. I mean, I, I really do think uh, last week's episode when we talked about Vani Week. Uh, was one of the best ones, at least one of my favorite ones, uh, favorite episodes of TVP thus far. Uh, really, obviously, valued your insight on the Siski region, as well as, uh, you know, uh, your knowledge on survivalism, uh, which I think was was, was v- very valuable uh, to the discussion. So I guess a quick question here, you know, Kyle's kind of MIA. Uh, so uh, how would you like to be my honorary co-host, uh, you know, at least uh, until uh, Kyle returns? You know what, Shane? I, I absolutely love this Vano stuff, and, and I just... I can't get enough of it, man, and I would, I would be very honored to help you with it. Awesome, awesome. Well, I, I yeah, I know. I, I, th- I thought about telling you before, you know, hey, I'm gonna mention this to you, but I said no, we'll just, you know, record the record. I guess the just do it, do it live, right? Uh, <laughs> or at least in the recording. So right on, right on. So I mean, yeah, I don't know when Kyle's gonna be back. I haven't even got, I haven't gotten an email back from him in probably a month. So I guess we'll, we'll, we'll just kind of have to see how that, uh, how that pans out. Uh, but uh, anyways, I mean, what's new from last week, man? It's only, it's only been, you know seven days since uh, since we've chatted but uh, what's what's going on anything new um no not really i mean my, my, my sky's less clear so there's less fires the temperature's down and yeah i feel a little bit happier about that <laughs> but yeah uh, so other... so ar- around where you are were there any uh was there any fear of uh, any of those forest fires uh not where i am i'm actually uh in the bay area san francisco oakland bay area but there were hmm. fires um upstate and and the the way the valley works is that the winds come from the north and it just it blows that smoke down the valley right into our area. Oh, so you don't have to worry about the fire, but you have to deal with the smoke then. Oh yeah, it, it mixes with our smog and creates just a wonderful environment. Oh, man, I wish I could I wish I could breathe that. That sounds awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, I'm I'm glad I'm glad things are starting to clear up there. But uh, I wanted to mention one thing. Uh, I, I I've started watching uh, something on Netflix called uh, the Confession Tapes. Uh, so you can probably kind of uh, you know guess where this is going. But uh, it's obviously obviously status is all hell. I mean, it's one of the uh, forensic crime shows, I guess you could say, uh, and, and at least and at least you know some some respects. But um, I, I, I watch I watch these these programs to you know help understand the ta- tactics of the bludgies even more. Uh, and it also, you know, was a you know a constant reminder of uh, not that not that we need them, right? With all of the nonsense going on, uh, with with with, with uh, police brutality and all that stuff. I mean, uh, just kind of you know keeps keeps to the forefront. Hey, the bludgies are not your friend. Uh, not that I need any reminders, but uh, so the, the show is premised around a bunch of cases where false confessions led to guilty convictions and you know really r- r- ridiculous life sentences. Uh, so I'm sure you've seen some of these tactics before where they kind of they try to implant the idea in your mind they'll kind of give you you know little clues and then and have you like kind of put the picture together and they t- they typically go after I guess more of the lower lower income lower IQ folks who really don't know any better. Um, it's obviously a frustrating show to watch uh, but you know watching some of these Watching some of these uh, interrogations happen, where the you know the the, the bludgies are ruthless. They don't give a damn about the actual truth. All they care about is uh, you know getting the conviction, getting that uh, I guess uh, getting uh, I guess that uh, that additional you know uh, win in a case, uh, which is uh, not not really a surprise, right? But uh, it's a really it's a it's, it's a good show, but it's a bad show too. I mean, it's it's frustrating as all hell. Uh, you know what, Shane? Uh, living here in the Bay Area, man, and and growing up how I did, uh, I actually I saw a lot of that. Um, cops that were just 
uh, the, the, the sheer fact that, that the police do not care about the truth is proven by the amount of cases in which evidence is planted. Oh, yeah. Right. Right. I mean, that I mean, the, the, the fact that police will plant evidence or, um, or or beat a confession out of somebody or or will beat somebody, period, proves right then and there that they are a not about the truth. They're B, they're not about protection. They don't work for the people. They work for the governments, and they are there to enforce the law. Whatever the law says, no matter how immoral it is, they are all about uh, enforcing said law because, quote, just doing my job. Yeah, yeah, and 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 I and I think you know listeners to the Bonnie podcast are you know privy to the privy to this information, but uh, you know I I think in a state of survival society when they hear like when when the term you know throw down like having a throw down weapon on you in case you you know kill a suspect or in case a bludgy kills a suspect and you know it wasn't justified, well, well plant a gun on him. Uh, I think they think that's kind of a joke or something in the movies, but um, there was a a really good white paper by uh, Roger Roots uh, published in the uh, Seton Hall Acad Academic Law Journal. Uh, called Our Cops Const Constitutional, and uh, he goes through uh, kind of, uh, you know, how, I guess, modern policing came into fruition, and that stuff uh, was, is so common. It's so common. I think most folks in the state of survival society just think it's kind of a joke or something, uh, I guess, uh, um, some, some hyperbole on TV shows or something, but it's not. Uh, it's not, but again, it kind of comes in, kind of gets back into the, uh, <laughs> just the, the, the belief in authority in general, right? Uh, <laughs> people people turned a blind eye to what uh, government and, and, and what the bludgies do because they're taught to turn a blind eye, right? They're, they're taught to unquestionably accept the law, unquestionably accept government, to, to unquestionably do what the person with the badge says, right? I mean, they're, they're indoctrinated into this belief in authority. Right, and and there was there was one lady. She was she was probably 60, 65 years old, and and, and this was from that uh, that TV show, the uh, the Confession Files, and uh, she's yeah she was like 60 or 65 years old. Her there was an arson incident at her house, uh, and her her daughter, her 14 year old daughter died, and uh, you know she she was talking after when she got when she got convicted. Uh, she was it was one of the phone calls from 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 prison, and uh, she was like I always, you know, respected the police. You know, I, I thought they were on my side and, you know, whenever they're interrogating me, I thought they were trying to help me and we were trying to get to the truth of what really happened to my daughter, but they didn't. <laughs> you know, they, they went after me the entire time. They forced a confession out of me and I'm in here serving uh, serving time for something I'd, for a crime that I didn't commit. Uh, so, I mean, that's that's a very, you know, very rude awakening. You know, not the best way to find out that the bludgies aren't on your side. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of folks, especially kind of the middle class neocon sort of folks, the ones that, uh, you know, worship everything that police officers do. Uh, I, I don't think they've actually really ever had any, uh, interactions with police officers other than, you know, uh, uh you know, you, you bump into one of them at a, at a coffee shop. Uh, they don't see the, the they don't see the, see it with their own eyes. It's kind of like war, right? Uh, war doesn't really seem. You know, w w I guess we've kind of become desensitized to war here in America, but in other countries, uh, no, it's very very real to them. Uh, it really yeah, is. The 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 phrase uh, "I can't see it from my house" comes to mind. Yeah, yeah, that's that's that, that's definitely true. That's definitely true. So so I guess I I did want to mention Kyle Reardon. Uh, I, I I say yeah, Kyle wrote a really good article. A few years back, uh, detailing uh, you know uh, a tutorial on how to roleplay police interrogations, and you know I, I think a, a lot of anarchists. I mean, the, you know, a lot of the focus is on kind of you know the, the police, and, I, and that's 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 fine. That's you know that's fine and all, and, and obviously the most folks are very aware of can kind of the phrase "we'll never talk to the police without a, without a lawyer present." But uh, you know, with roleplaying police interrogations. Especially in person, if preferable. I mean, those that that's that's something I think I think everyone should do. Uh, I really do. Oh, ab absolutely. And uh, uh, just just to modernize what, what we're saying. I mean, we're not talking about ten years ago, fifteen years ago, twenty years ago. We're talking about right now. All right. I mean, last week, uh, in St. Louis, St. Louis, right now, they're having riots and protests and all that good stuff because of this exact sort of thing, right? The the Anthony Lamar Smith case. The officer, uh, Jason Stokely, right, he, he shot this guy back in 2011, went to trial, blah, 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 was just found not guilty. Well, the gun that that uh, Smith supposedly had, 
the police found in the car, but there's no DNA from Smith on it. Only Smo- only Stokely, the police officer's DNA <laughs> is on the gun. That that the the, 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 car, the gun that they found in the car only had the cop's DNA on it. It didn't have the suspect's DNA at all. Didn't matter though, did it? No, he still got found not guilty. Yep. Yep, yep, and that's, uh, you know, this stuff happens, uh, you know, every single day, and, uh, you know, even though, uh, I, I guess, uh, personally, I've never had any any encounters like that, I, I did have two police encounters then a three-month span a couple of years back, but but still, I mean, with all of these videos that come out on Fascist Book and, uh, you know, all of these all of these instances, uh, it's definitely not isolated, guys, uh, but the listeners of the Bonnie Podcast uh, definitely definitely know that here, uh, but I guess just as, a, just as a quick reminder, you know, five rules with dealing with bludgies. Number one, innocent until proven guilty is a myth. It just uh, doesn't matter. Like I said, and, and kind of you know, if you look at plenty of cases, the 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 you know the truth doesn't matter. What matters is uh, you know convictions. And uh, number two, never talk to the bludgies. Number three, never talk to the bludgies. Number four, never talk to the bludgies. And number five, can you guess what it is, Jason? Um, I'm gonna go with never talk to the bludgies. And you are the winner. You are the winner there, sir. <laughs> Uh, ding, 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 <laughs> ding. So I, I figured I'd, I'd kind of bring that up. Uh, we, we don't talk about bludgies a whole lot here. Um, but, uh, you know, for anyone interested in one of the, in, uh, in that, uh, I guess, documentary, I'll put, I'll put that in quotes, documentary in, a, in, in quotes. Um, you know, objectivity is a little tough in, in since then, uh, you know, some dramatic uh, interpretations and things. But, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's decent so far. It's decent so far. So I figured I'd toss that out there. So this episode is entitled Letters About Vonu, 1985. And the show notes can be found at vonnypodcast.com forward slash intermission eight. So if you haven't already and would like to follow along, please pick up a free copy of Vonu Book 2 by visiting vonnypodcast.com forward slash Vonu 2. And also, if you appreciate the work put into it, uh, you know, into digitizing these publications, it takes a lot of time, guys. Uh, and, and obviously, if you appreciate, uh, you know, the value they provide to Vonu as a whole, uh, please consider shooting us a donation. That's vonupodcast.com forward slash donate. Uh, so what do we have for you today? Well, until we can return to the normal schedule, we'll be covering articles from uh, the new libertarian publications uh, we've been able to obtain. Uh, so specifically, specifically for this episode, uh, from Vonu Book 2. Uh, we'll cover, uh, number one, a letter from Roger Kenmore regarding Vonu uh, from September 1985. Uh, number two, comments for Roger Kenmore from Jim Stum. And number three, comments on camping by Bert in Oregon. I've got a nice little uh, story to tell uh, along with that one. So uh, you'll definitely want to stay tuned uh, to hear that. So this should uh, certainly make for an interesting discussion. And uh, we'll see uh, Jim Stum descent from, uh, from Vonu uh, once again. Uh, so hopefully, you know, it'll be a little more genuine this time, but... Uh, you know, I wouldn't get your hopes up on that one, guys. So, uh, anything before we uh, get to it, Jason? Uh, one more. I just wanted to say, don't trust the bludgies because the bludgies are trained to not trust you. Yes, that is true. That is true. <laughs> very good, very good. So let's go ahead and get into it here. Uh, so again, letter from Roger Kenmore in response to uh, Jim Stum's Jim Stum's comment in September 1985. Quote, Dear Jim, I'm writing in response to your comment in Living Free number 31, and this is Jim's comment. Quote. I think I'm a lot freer on my rural acreage than Rayo was in his hideout. Sure, I pay $100 a year in taxes, but after that I can do as I please. That costs me less than all this sneaking around costs Rayo. End quote. Now we're going back to Roger, uh, Roger Kenmore. Quote, you could also say that you spent two years in the U.S. Army, but after that you can do as much as you please. Modern statism, with its claim of preserving a free society, will allow you to do as you please after you have complied with its regulations and paid its taxes. But as you yourself make clear, and in, in is self-liberation possible, uh, and from Random Writings number two, sneaking around is the best means of achieving more freedom in a society dominated by a state. You fault Rayo for bearing too high a cost for too little a benefit, but you forget that his values are not necessarily your values. Perhaps his valuation of freedom was higher, and his disvaluation of sneaking around was lower than yours. What sort of freedom do you get on your rural acreage for your $100 per year taxes? How free would you be at $1,000 per year? How free would you be if the state took over your land to build a road or use your deed as a means to find you uh, to find you to send you into the army? If by freedom you really mean solitude, why not say so? It is a leg- legitimate enough desire. I've often thought that the notion of freedom is closely connected to pride. To that extent, the power of another, including the state, can be opposed by either self-liberation or power. Rayo sought to live without needing a driver's license or vehicle registration, you have given up this freedom and consider it a benefit worth the cost to be able to drive on government roads with little fear of harassment, 
even though you know the government has you by the balls. It is hard to rationalize the benef benefits of not having a vehicle, owning land, or collecting a taxable income, aside from the pride of knowing one is not at the mercy and bidding of the state. Unless, of course, one is running from the law because of a specific crime, or one has new nightmares, or one has nightmares of a totalitarian future, or one sees oneself as pioneering a new lifestyle. How do you rationalize your own long-term efforts and discomforts to minimize your taxable income so as to give you little money as possible to the government? As if in this, in this society of millions, your income tax can make any palpable difference to the state. End quote. Uh, sincerely, uh, Roger Kenmore. So, you know, I really like this because he actually goes directly against Jim Stum. He's like, hey, dude, well, something's wrong here. What, do, what are you saying? <laughs> What were your thoughts on uh, on his letter to or on his comments to Jim Stump? Uh, I I think uh, I don't want to say he got hostile there, but he he definitely went directly at him. Like he he wasn't beating around the bush. He wasn't trying to hint at things. He came right at him and and said, you know, you know, what sort of freedom do you get on your rural acreage for a hundred dollars in your taxes? Well, it it does. I have to say that it doesn't matter how much taxes you pay, right? Whether you pay a hundred dollars, you pay a thousand dollars. The laws uh, that are enforced will be applied to you the same. So whether you own a hundred acres or a thousand acres, it, it the amount of freedom that you realistically have doesn't change. You know, and then yeah, and then and then at the very at the very end there, he said, uh. Uh, as if in society of millions, quote, your income tax could make a palpable, di palpable difference to the state. The state will come after you for $18. It doesn't it, <laughs> it doesn't matter how much money you owe the state. They, will, they sold a lady's house in Pennsylvania over over. I think I think it was eighty one dollars in in um, property tax. $81, $81. They took away this lady's house, sold it at a profit, and then kept the profit. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and that's that's that's, def that's definitely a good point. Uh, it, de it definitely is. But, uh, you know, I, I just really appreciate that someone went up against Jim Stum because I would def I'd, I'd be I, I, I wouldn't obviously word it this way. And I think I would point out different uh, different, you know, disagreements. But uh, but I think, you know, the, the point that the, the, the point that Roger Kenmore is making here is uh, so. So, OK, how much more freedom do you have, uh, you know, by paying taxes? And, and uh, he's, he's kind of just uh, saying that. You're just paying the state to leave you alone. You know, it's it's kind of like a bribe. Uh, only if it's uh, uh, only it, it, only other than you know just being a pure bribe, there's force behind it too. Uh, so I, I think I think Roger makes some interesting points, and uh, I, I tend to agree with him more than I do Jim. And we'll we'll hear uh, Jim's uh, response to it soon. But uh, but yeah, you know I I think he uh, brings up some some good points here, and maybe pointing out uh, you know maybe some some uh, you know some I guess unclarity if that's a word uh, in Jim's thinking. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he, he says right here that it, it is hard to rationalize the benefits of not having a vehicle, owning land, or collecting a taxable income aside from the pride of knowing one is not at the mercy or bidding of the state. Well, you still are at the mercy of the state. It, it doesn't it doesn't matter how much you give them or 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 how much. <sighs> How much you you bend to to the government's uh, edicts, you're still at the mercy of the state. So, not having a vehicle, not having a, a license, not paying uh, taxes on your income, it doesn't eliminate you from coercion, but it does no. lessen the government's ability to crack down on you. Exactly, and and and, uh, and you know, I'm, I'm I'm glad he mentioned kind of the. Uh, you know the the government roads here because even though you even though you do uh, you know pay the state uh, you know for that so-called privilege as they like to call it uh, you pay for the roads but it's still a privilege for you to drive on them uh, <laughs> you pay for the Xbox but Best Buy it's it's the privilege is still from Best Buy if that you get to use that Xbox uh, as an example it sounds so backwards and it is I mean nothing with the state makes sense uh, but uh, even though you pay, you pay off the state so you can have that so-called privilege. Uh, you know, you, where where do, where do most uh, you know police encounters or bludgeoning encounters happen? They happen on government roads with drivers. So uh, so, so yeah, I think that's uh, a, a good point there by uh, by Mr. Kenmore. Oh, absolutely. 
All right. Anything else there? Should we move on to uh, Jim's response? Where I think most of the most of the the, the rebuttals will come into play. I, I like I like Jim's response. <laughs> All right. Let's get to it. All right. So return comments for Roger Kenmore from Jim Stump. Uh, 1985. So here we go. Quote, here are some of the things I'm free to do on my rural acreage that a wilderness Vanuan is not free to do. Of greatest importance, I can be seen on my land by neighbors or even by government officials without the fear of bad consequences, whereas a Vanuan must avoid being seen by anyone, as Rayo makes quite clear. Then I can openly, pl openly plant gardens, trees, bushes, uh, while the Vanuan can only attempt cryptoculture, trying to hide all signs of cultivation. I can cut down any trees I want, while the Vanuan must select trees to cut at wide intervals far from his building site. I can cut trails and clearings and make any changes in the landscape that I please, while the Vanuan must spend his time wiping out signs of trails, etc. End quote. So I want to stop there for a second, because uh, the assumption is made here that if one owns, you know, rural rural acreage, um, therefore they aren't a Vanuan. Um, that's not necessarily that's that's not true. If we go by definitions here, Vanuan is anyone who, you know, strives to make themselves more invulnerable to coercion, right? So, uh, so someone, I mean, that's that's my plan is to go, uh, you know, Southern Illinois, a town of 50 people, you know, probably 10 minutes outside of that town, uh, you know, go out there where uh, where no one really lives. I think my uh, my nearest neighbor would be, uh, you know, probably uh, half a mile down the road. Um, that's what I plan on doing, uh, just because, you know, my situation precludes me from pursuing wilderness fauna, and, and, you know, that sort of life seems more attractive to me anyways. So, uh, I guess the, the, the main point here is that a Vanuan could pursue, I guess, rural homesteading, um, whereas I think Jim kind of just eliminates that as a possibility, um, which I, I think is, uh, is, is wrong of him to do, but what are your thoughts so far? Uh, I, I agree completely with that. Um, the, 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 the phrase, uh, uh, out of sight, out of mind is, is really coming, coming to my head here is... If you live in, in, in a rural area on, on a property and, and you just you leave you leave everybody else alone, right? I mean you do your thing on your land, you garden, you homestead, you you hunt, you uh you do whatever, you know, on your land, you leave your neighbors alone. Generally the government is going to leave you alone also as long as you're you're paying them off, right? As long as you're paying the their their bribe. Um right. and uh uh the the big thing here is is the word rural, right? If if you are in middle of nowhere, like if if you're in Wyoming or or middle of Montana or you know southeast Ohio or or southern Illinois, Indiana, where you're talking about, uh, the number of people is a lot less. Ergo, the number of government is a lot less. Whereas exactly, whereas here in the Bay Area and the San Francisco Oakland Bay Area, I'm I'm technically what's called the East Bay. If if I were to go buy, you know, two acres or, or a couple acres of land, not only is it going to cost me an arm and a leg, but the amount of government oversight to that land is crazy ridiculous. I mean, where I'm in a watershed, I'm in a floodplain. I got the uh, the the air quality management. I got the state people. I got the county people. I got right. the city people. You know, and then I, and then I'm in the Bay Area, so I'm subject to wildlife laws. Because of because we are in in the flyway the, the migration routes, so it's it the 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 less people that you're around generally, the less worries that you have of government. Exactly, exactly, and and, and Kyle and I have talked about this in previous episodes, uh, at least maybe one or two previous episodes of the Vonnie podcast. But uh, but if you consider like if we're going to do a comparison here, like New York City. Uh, or uh, Chicago versus uh, Southern Illinois, uh, it's it, like if, if you're if someone's gonna make that move, m make a move from from th from here to there, there to here, um, you know, going from Chicago to Southern Illinois, I mean that's that automatically makes you that much more invulnerable to coercion. Um, as you said, you know the the you know the less dense population because you you know Vanu doesn't doesn't uh, you know just neglect the uh, the private criminals. Uh, which uh, you know a lot of that does happen in, in, in large cities, so um, that just that move alone makes you that much more invulnerable to coercion. And then plus, you know where I'm looking at going, uh, the town is so small they don't have a government. There's a township committee of like three people, but they don't do a damn thing. Um, they don't have any money to do anything. Everyone there's broke. They're welfare whores essentially. Yeah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're all they're all Hillary. They're all uh, Hillary voters, uh, which was surprising to me when I learned about that this past uh, you know selection cycle. But 
But I, I can see I, I I can see Roger's point there uh, to a degree that yeah I mean you're, you're paying all you're paying off the state to leave you alone with paying property taxes but that's the only interaction with government that you have um, and obviously it's an unfortunate one but uh, you know not everyone is suited to you know pursue wilderness spawning some people have situations that preclude them from being able to do so uh, and plus uh, you know I, I tend to uh, I, I tend to agree with uh, with with Jim here, and this is one of the few times I'll say it. But uh, I, I agree with him on the on on the fact that uh, you know you can do a lot more. Uh, like you can you know I I'm, I plan on doing permaculture farming. You can't do that, uh, you know if you're you do if you're a wilderness venue and as Jim points out. So uh, you know I think he makes some very good points here as as far as you know some people would rather do this. Some people you know very few people would would want to pursue wilderness farming, but. Um, you know, this, uh, you know, the, the rural homesteading is a, a very real, uh, you know, much like uh, much higher likelihood of a of solution that people are going to pick up on. And people are. Oh, yeah. I, I love the idea. I personally love the idea of, you know, five, six, ten acres in the middle of nowhere with some timber and a little bit of pasture and being left the hell alone. <laughs> I love that idea. Uh, and, and as you said, you know, you can't go out and, and you can't plant a garden in, in the forest because the, the, the forest, like I said, it, it's monitored. There's all sorts of government agencies, blah, blah, blah. There's people flying over. They're doing tree counts and, and tracking wolves and, and everything else. And if you have a garden in the middle of the forest, it's going to send up huge red flags and that's going to expose you to coercion. But a garden on your land, you know, in BFN nowhere – Sounds perfect. Yeah, yeah, and Ray and Rayo too. Oh, which this is what confuses me about Jim Stum is he's so familiar with the Vani publications. He even, you know, uh, you know, was able to acquire, you know, Vani book too, all of the stuff that went into that. So he was very familiar with it, which it's just surprising that he he makes that assumption, even though Rayo doesn't even rule out uh, you know, kind of homesteading on private land. He just raises some very, very uh some some concerning points against, you know, uh ownership of so called private property, right? Um, so Rayo himself doesn't even roll that out, but Jim j makes the Jim jumps even further and makes this, this, this assumption that Vanuans, uh, you know, can't do this rural homesteading thing, which I do not like, and I'm not sure why he's. It's I don't know. It's confirmation bias. Probably yeah. Well, he he he, he obviously thinks his way is better, um, and he's already voiced plenty of his uh, disagreements with Rayo. So so yeah, I guess that that's probably that's probably it. He's trying to I guess show that his way is best or something. I don't know. Uh, as if it's a competition, right? Oh, totally, totally. You gotta win at life. <laughs> All right, let's <laughs> let's get back to it here. Plenty there, more to discuss. There's oh, only so go ahead. there's only one way to Vanu. There's only one way to anarchy. Get it right. Get it right. Come on now. <laughs> You're not a real Vanuan. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Back to oh, it. I almost, spit I almost spit water everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> You're not a real Vanuan. No, that's I, I, you know, I, I, I look forward to the day where, where I'm, I'm hopeful for the day when Vanu is picked up, you know, uh, picked up by, by quite a few folks. But I'm also not looking forward to uh, all of the nonsense that would come with it, as, as has come with, come with uh, you know, kind of the anarchist circles. Uh, that's going to be a little frustrating, and we're going to have a Vani political crusader, so-called Vani political crusaders. Uh, the, God, I'm not looking forward to that time. I'm not. So <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a double-edged sword, right? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. You know, as as ideas get big, they're going to get picked apart. They're going to get picked apart, and they're going to get adopted by people who don't truly understand them. Yep, yep. <laughs> and uh, you know, as as uh, as uh, you know, the the man who falsely imagined himself to be uh, our ruler, uh, Ronald Reagan, called himself a libertarian. Just wait until uh, no, this was that's not gonna happen. But wait until the president's like, I'm a Vanuan. <laughs> <laughs> no, I no, that would. <laughs> I'm 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 a New York Vanuan. I, I was a Vanuan before it was popular. <laughs> would you? Would you Gosh. Let's go to Starbucks. <laughs> right. Oh man. Yeah. Not looking forward to, to to all that sorts of stuff. And it it's unlikely to happen. But uh, I I I don't look forward to the day. Uh, well, I, I do and I don't. But uh, let's let's get back to it here. Quote: Of course, I wouldn't be any freer if I paid a thousand dollars a year in property taxes rather than a hundred dollars a year. It's not a question of buying freedom in proportion to tax dollars spent, but rather a yes or no situation to be in legal possession of the property or not. You ask how free I would be if the state took over my land for uh, for a road. The probability of that happening to any given landowner is low, about like being struck by lightning. But the same question could be put to a troglodyte venuan. 
How free would Rayo be if he spent a couple of years building an underground home on public land and then the state cut a road through nearby? Actually, a landowner has the advantage because if the new road by bypassed his property by only a few yards, he could still remain, but if a new road was cut through even a mile away from Rayo's remote den, he would probably uh, be compelled to abandon it. You ask, what, what if the state used my deed to find me to send me into the army? I haven't heard of draft boards searching property deeds to find draft evaders. Anyway, I'm not, a risk, I'm not at risk from the draft. If I were, I would probably use an alias and lease some acreage from a farmer rather than buy it. Still, there are ways to buy land and still keep your name off the records. You could create a false ID in your new name. Then again, I don't recall being asked to prove my identity when I bought my land. I suppose I could have my, I could have used any name I wanted as long as I could receive mail in that name. Uh, end quote. So I'll stop there. He goes on, uh, and I'll read this obviously, but he goes on for uh, for other other ways you could, I guess, uh, you know, purchase land. But there are some interesting things to uh, to mention there. So first, I think the first uh, the first point here, and you can tell, tell you can kind of tell the uh, I guess the, the the outdatedness of some of these details, uh, where apparently he was he didn't have to provide any identification to purchase a house. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's not the case today. No, that's not the case today. There's like six <laughs> layers deep of identification. Uh, you know, if you do it the traditional way. Uh, and there's, uh, you know, three or four middlemen most of the time, unless you, you know, get directly a uh, buyer to seller uh, or vice versa. So that's just one detail where it's, okay, uh, yeah, you probably have to utilize some of the other strategies, uh, you know, Jim mentions there. But uh, but as far as, uh, you know, draft, uh, you know, draft, uh, the, the draft, that's been something that's been discussed. Uh, I don't think they would... Um, I wonder, I haven't heard of draft board searching property deeds to find draft evaders. You know, that's probably something they would do today. Uh, I believe so. If there was a draft today, they would use every means every means possible. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I have, I have, I have no doubt whatsoever. Yeah. Um, every, every, so, everybody yeah. has a very extensive uh, digital um, trail, I guess is, is the right word to use. You, you would not be hard to find no matter where you are. No, no, not yet. Unless you were, I mean, they're they're arguable. Like Kyle and I have talked about it. Some of these, uh, some of these potentials, we'll do it much more in season three. But you know, there are ways to you know successfully run from the state. But uh, you would be on the run, and you would have to you you'd, you'd be uh, you'd be outside of uh, any of the major financial institutions unless you got felt unless you got fake identification. Um, it would be difficult. It would be uh, maybe not impossible, but it would be difficult. Uh, and you'd, you'd very likely have to, you know, actually just flee the country. That'd probably be your best bet. Yeah, or, you know, be really, 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 really good at the whole gray man theory and blending in. And yeah, you, it, it would require a lot of luck and a lot of skill. It reminds me of um, the last season. It was the last season of Breaking Bad where he was out there up in the uh, up in the mountains, and he had someone bring him food like once, bring him supplies like once a month. And other than that, he just stayed in that one in that little log cabin. I think that'd be the only realistic way, uh, you know, without having to flee. So you're essentially you're doing wilderness Vanu again, right? Uh, you, you can do wilderness Vanu, or I mean, you could even blend in in New York City if if you knew how to do it. If you know the. The whole quote gray man theory. I don't know, uh -huh, I don't know if you're yeah. familiar with that one, but uh, oh yeah, you can do that. I mean, there's there's millions and millions of faceless homeless people in this country, and you could you could realistically uh, become one. Right. Yeah. Ray, Ray did talk about uh, you know kind of like you know joining a ghetto or something like that, uh, or uh, or like a joining a group of freaks. I think is what he kind of. I think that's probably what he's referring to as like kind of the the homeless nomad sort of things. Um, but yeah, you know, if you're a group, you blend in. Um, so so yeah, I think that's. I think it would be possible to do that in the city too. Um, but uh, you know, I I really don't think most folks today. Uh, well, I guess most folks today don't have the have the uh, skills to to do uh, you know wilderness fauna either. So, whatever. <laughs> both both of the solutions are available for people who may have the skills. So, most, most count, people, making counter arguments against myself before I even finish my sentence. Most most people today would starve if left to their own vices. True, <laughs> they would true. they would absolutely starve. Yes, oh. yes, they would. And then uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> You know, as, as Colin and I discussed in the food storage episode at the very beginning, you know, uh, people run out of food. They do crazy, crazy things such as cannibalism. So, um, hey, look, yeah. look what they'll do the day after Thanksgiving for a TV. Yep. Right. Not you, even ba not even about survival. Just, uh, yeah, to, just over, over you know, things. Yeah. To get to get two hundred dollars off on a big screen TV. Right. Well, 
Right. Good point. Good point. So let's get back to it. Quote, other ways are to set up a corporation, perhaps offshore, and buy land in the name of the corporation. Or you might make a deal with an organization that you have no connection with, for example, a for-profit corporation or a non-profit or a church by which they buy land you select with money you've loaned to them, uh, loan in quotation marks, loan to them, then they lease it back to you for as long as you live. At your death, it reverts to them. That's their payoff. A non-profit or church may be exempt from paying property taxes, but playing that game might be pushing uh, your luck. End quote. So, I mean, those are those are some other possibilities. Uh, Jeremy Hengler and I talked to, about a couple of those things, uh, you know, as, as potential possibilities for, uh, you know, uh, purchasing land uh, without having that, uh, I guess, that with, with avoiding some of the issues that do come with land ownership. So, you know, viable solutions, I would say, uh, just depending upon... Uh, if, they, if that's if that's all that you're left with and you have to uh, you know kind of uh, work through the state the the, the corporate fiction uh, the the whole corporation thing then yeah I mean that is a, a potential solution oh absolutely the uh, the the set up a corporation idea is not new um, and mm. it's it's very very much in use today you could set up a, a like an LLC or something like that and and uh, buy the land that way. It's it. They do it the same. They do the same sort of thing. Like groups of quote sportsmen, you know, gun owners. They'll, they'll form like an LLC, a, a sportsman's corporation or a sportsman's group, um, and that largely exempts them from not only background checks, um, tax stamps, and, and whatnot. And they do that, and they get like they'll buy um, like bulk amounts of suppressors or or bulk amounts of, of firearms from from these companies. Um, as a way of, of skirting the rest of the laws, and and I okay, so 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 corporations, uh, that's that's an interesting point you bring up. So corporations, they don't have to go through the same, well, I guess, firearm background checks, um, as as do individuals. Is that what you're saying? Yes, because it is is they are corporate. They're they're they become the property of the corporation, uh -huh, not yeah. of the individuals. Interesting, <laughs> interesting. I like that. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, de I definitely like that. So yeah, there there are uh, you know legal interstices available uh, that that can be utilized. Um, so let's see here. Let's go ahead and, and move forward here. Quote: As for really meaning solitude, when I say freedom, that charge applies to Raya more than to me. I have had visitors at my land, and I didn't blindfold them or swear them to secrecy. It's no concern to me if they tell others about my property. Raya, on the other hand, is notoriously secretive about his home site. So which of us is really pursuing solitude and quote, that's a good point. That is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but, uh, but, but you know, if I'm, when I'm moving out to Southern Illinois, it's, it's going to be for solitude too. Right. Yeah. I mean, you, you can, you can be solitude in New York city if you, if you truly want to, you know, with, with every, everything's delivered, you got Amazon, you got, you know, Grubhub, things like that. You can have true solitude no matter where you are, but you can't have the same freedom where you are, wherever, wherever you are. Like, you know, you, you have you can have solitude in New York City, you can have solitude in, in, in you know Wyoming, but you don't have the same freedom in New York City that you would in Wyoming. Right. Yes, yes. I just wanted to make that uh, I just wanted to point out, you know, that's a, that is a definitely, you know, a good point made by uh, made by Jim there. Rayo definitely uh <laughs> you know, uh, solitude. That's what Rayo that's what that's one of the things, uh, you know, other than freedom and, and vulnerability and coercion. Uh, definitely solitude, especially considering, you know, the last letter he wrote to, I think, John Fisher, uh, where he just kind of said, uh, you know, screw organizations, you know, I don't like libertarians anymore. I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to disappear. Uh, well, he didn't say that. He didn't say he was going to disappear in the letter, but he did soon after that. So, uh, so yeah, solitude. Yeah, that's, that was the, the end goal for Rayo, it seemed. Uh, maybe not uh, the, the the end goal from the beginning, but uh, towards the end, definitely. Yeah, uh, Rayo, Rayo talked about... Um, uh, economic collapses and and government you know tyrannical governments and things like that like he really really he he wanted to be alone he wanted to be away from not only the government coercion but the coercion of you know quote civilians uh in that sort of situation oh yeah definitely definitely and yeah that that was uh yeah, he he wrote about uh, he wrote about this stuff quite a bit. Uh, he did. It wasn't the only thing he prepared for, but he prepared for all of those things too. Uh, and obviously, that's why he wanted to be out there in the woods because, you know, as you said, you know, even on uh, Black Friday, you know, uh, uh, the uh, the folks in the Status of All Society uh, go a little nutty. Uh, so yeah, he probably wanted to stay far away from that. Uh, yeah. So uh, that, that's a good point too. Just imagine Black Friday. Imagine something terrible actually happening. 
Uh, yeah, you better hope you can get the hell out of the city. <laughs> they, they, you better hope. They say it only takes three days from that for the average grocery store to run out of food. Yep. Oh. Yep. And then, uh, and if you're still there after that time, oh, you've got you've got some problems on your hand probably. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I don't blame Rayo there for that. I don't. No. <laughs> Definitely not. Definitely not. <sighs> Slaves get restless and crazy. Um, anyways, uh, let's get back to it. Quote, lowering my income taxes isn't the only reason for my low-income lifestyle. I also want to be employed only about 20 hours a week, so I have time for other things. And I found I don't like the pressures to conform pressure, pressures to conform imposed on me by employers when I was in management as manager of a checking account department in a bank. Now, as a janitor, I find that mostly nobody pays attention to me. The main thing is I pursue my own values, which are somewhat different from yours or Rayo's. I mention quite often that we all have different subjective values. Rayo, however, seems to have never realized that. He oh, bullshit. Uh, he often says that he often <laughs> says or implies that people who don't adopt his wilderness Benuan lifestyle must not be truly committed to freedom, not realizing that other people may want to be free to do different things, which cannot easily be done in the woods or not easily without owning one's uh, owning owning one's own land. End quote. So, yeah, I said bullshit there. Uh, Rayo does not imply that only only people that do uh, pursue wilderness Vanu, uh, you know, are Vanuans or you know committed to actually you know f committed to freedom. Why does he propose all of these other strategies if he thinks that wilderness Vanu uh, wilderness uh, Vanuism is the only way there? Uh, that's a that's a complete and utter bullshit boldface lie uh, that Jim just. Made. Rayo himself said that he doesn't favor wilderness Vanu. <laughs> like, yeah, he did, yes, yes. And uh, yeah, in this uh, in the same one, he mentions that uh, you know, Wilderness Vanu isn't that great. So Rayo himself didn't even favor Wilderness Vanu. So yeah, sorry Jim, I think you're off base here, bud. <laughs> yeah, Jim. <laughs> Jim. Jim needs to go back and read a few things. <laughs> he needs a refresher. Uh, uh, I I do like that he says uh, now as a janitor, I find that mostly nobody pays attention to me. That's that gray man theory that I was talking about about blending in. Uh, and when when you blend it, uh, the, the Japanese have a, have a saying that says the nail that sticks out gets hammered. When you blend in with a group, or when you blend in uh, in in servile society, you you virtually disappear. Like nobody pays attention to the mailman. Nobody pays attention to the janitor. Nobody. Or the, the or pretty much any service yeah. person. Uh, I mean, yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, if 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 you can if you can blend in, then you can have. A, a, a certain level of freedom that someone that sticks out doesn't have, you know, or, or not, not freedom. Freedom is not the word. A certain level of invulnerability to coercion that somebody that sticks out that doesn't have, you know. Exactly. It's uh, it's, it's like, uh, you know, driving an inconspicuous car. If you drive a, a bright yellow Mustang, uh, you're going to stick out more than someone with a silver Camry. Uh, it's, uh, you know, the, the, the idea, if, if the goal is invulnerability to coercion or getting as close to it as possible, which is the, the more realistic way to put it, uh, then yeah, you know, the, the gray man technique is something that, uh, you know, really should come into play, especially if, uh, it's more of kind of the Vanu and cities thing, uh, which, yeah, you can learn more about that. Uh, Kyle, uh, actually wrote an anthology, uh, just below the surface, a guide to security culture, which uh, covers the gray man and a bunch of other, uh, you know, uh, uh, things like that. Uh, which I highly recommend you check out. I don't remember what the uh, short URL is for that, but if you just go to uh, libertyunderattack.com and search for security culture uh, or just below the surface, you'll be able to pull that up. And I highly recommend, you know, anyone pursuing venuans, uh, you got to have good security culture no matter what strategy you're pursuing. That's just kind of a necessity. Uh, it, with, without security, without uh, situational awareness also, um, without those two things, you're not going to, you're not not only are you not going to enjoy, but you're not going to thrive. And 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 whatever whatever yeah. Vanu outlet that you choose to do. Exactly, exactly. So let's uh, see what else Mister uh, Jim Stem has to say. See, okay, so that was the, that's the when I read this, uh, I posted the status on the Vanu podcast page, and I said, and it said something along the lines of, you know, I really want to call Jim Stem a douchebag right now, but. Uh, he's, but he's, he's done so many, he's put out so, so many of these publications that I, I, I have to, you know, at least give him some credit, right? This was that main point where I said, you've got to be kidding me, dude. 
You've got to be kidding me. You went and met Ray and Roberta. You published all these publications. You 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 put out Vanu book two, and you have the gall to say that. Okay, come on, come on. <laughs> so that that that's the one that kind of that really that really kind of annoyed me when I read that. But again, you know, I I, I can't I can't talk too badly about Jim, uh, considering you know we wouldn't have these publications without him because it looks like he pretty much did all of them, uh, or put all of them together and made them available for sale. Yeah. So. Uh, credit or credit's due, and you know, in, in a lot of the publications, he does offer some really, really, you know, interesting things. So, uh, I'm not going to toss the baby out of the bathwater, but, uh, but uh, you know, I would scold him if, uh, you know, if, if I could, you know, have a conversation with him yeah. today. Uh, may, maybe not, but <laughs> I, I, I appreciate Jim, but I adamantly disagree with him. Right, right. At least with that, at least oh, with, with that with, one with point. With that point, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. All right, let's see if we can find anything else to disagree with. Uh, <laughs> quote, sure, you can scrupulously obey all laws and pay all taxes, and government would then probably not harass you. But living free is edited for people for whom that solution to the freedom problem is intolerable. My argument for landowning is not just advocacy of that solution. Rather, I see landowning as a special case where costs can be so low and benefits so high that avoiding it makes no sense. For example, I get two tax bills a year in the mail totaling about $100. I pay them by mail. That's all the contact I have ever had with government as a landowner since I bought my land. The county knows nothing about me except my name and address, and they have no reason to inquire. I also paid one time $2,500 for six acres, which I'd recover more or less if I sell the land. That's all my cost for which I get all the benefits alluded to above. You make a stronger case against legally driving a motor vehicle on government roads because that costs much more than owning land costs me. My mandatory car insurance alone costs more than my property taxes. Where do you live, guy? Uh, <laughs> uh, and a driver is at risk of being stopped and harassed by cops every moment that he is driving, whereas the landowner's, uh, landowner is at much less risk of being harassed while he is at home on his land. On the contrary, it is the Vanuan hiding out in the National Forest who is constantly at risk of being harassed by forest bludge. So who is really freer? End quote. So there are a couple of points there. That first one I kind of I kind of chimed in. Where does he live that his car insurance costs more than his property taxes? <laughs> that's crazy. I, uh, I, th I think I think I pay like six or seven hundred dollars for insurance. Maybe it's like it's forty bucks, what forty times twelve, whatever that comes out to be. And uh, property taxes four hundred eighty. I'm not good at math. I went to government schools. I'm sorry. Uh, I can tie my shoes. So <laughs> yeah, so so four hundred eighty dollars versus like two thousand dollars plus for property. Tax. Yeah, where does this guy live? I I don't know. <laughs> I want to know what he. I wanna... Well, he he lives in New he lives in New York actually. That's where he lives. What does he drive then? <laughs> good question. Like this doesn't this doesn't make sense. You know, or or it makes no sense. What whatsoever. does he drive, or how many vehicles does he have? That that's a good question. Yeah, yeah. He he's doing something wrong. Like uh, or I... or as pre as we previously discovered, maybe he's exaggerating. Maybe yes, that that that's probably the that's probably the the much uh, more likely possibility here. Yeah, you know, Jim d Jim yeah. does like to go out on a limb and make certain acquis or accusations and exaggerate. Right. That's okay. Yeah, that probably makes uh, that 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 makes uh, a lot more sense. So uh, so yeah, take that with a grain of salt, guys. That doesn't that doesn't that doesn't make any financial sense whatsoever. Uh, now, let's see. I feel like there is one other point here. Um, yeah, so, so I, I guess, uh, and, and uh, I guess another point for the financials, he gets two tax bills a year in the mail totaling about a hundred dollars. Um, that's still, I, I, I don't know, still that, that's, I think he's, yeah, I think he's exaggerating there too. Cause that would be his property taxes. And then probably what would the other tax be for, uh, property, yeah, property tax. And I, I don't know what the other one would be, but yeah, a hundred dollars for that. Uh, in New York, uh, New York state of all places. I don't know what exact city, but uh, but yeah, I'd, I'd expect, uh, you know, that to be uh, at least uh, quite a bit higher than that. Um, let's see here. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's pretty much all I have here. Uh, do you got anything else? Uh, yeah, the, the, the last sentence here says, uh, on the contrary, it is the Vanuan hiding in the national forest who is constantly at risk of being harassed by the forest bludge. Uh, that's not, well, it, it's, it's not exactly true, but it's not, it's not wrong. Okay. It, it depends on on where again where you live, where where Ray was, you know the the California Oregon border, middle of the state off Highway 199. There's nothing there, okay. There's there's no cities, there's no military base, no airport, there's no universe. There's nothing. Where at? 
So he did. So 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 Ray, most of what Rayo did was just precautions, because um, I, I think he mentioned. I, actually, for Wilderness Vanu, I don't think he ever he ever mentioned in any publications that he'd ever been harassed. Uh, he mentioned a couple of times uh, in when he was pursuing van nomadism, but that was in a vehicle. Um, and so we'll we'll get to here in a moment uh, when we uh, get to the letter from Bert regarding camping or comments on camping uh, by Bert. Him and uh, Holly uh, and their backpack camping, they really have never been harassed either. So, uh, and, and and to, to kind of make a counterpoint here to to Mr. Stum. As I, as I said earlier, uh, where do most interactions with bludgies happen? They happen on government roads. So he pays car insurance, which means that he drives on the government road. So he is constantly at risk of being harassed by, uh, you know, the, uh, I guess, the, uh, the road bludgies. So uh, I, I think he's kind of projecting here a little bit. Oh, absolutely. You know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, where there are people, there are bludgies, right? So, so the more people you have, the more government you have. Where Rail was, there was nothing. Where Jim is is in, in New York, even upstate New York. It, there's still, there's still a lot. There's still a good amount of people, so there's still a good amount of government. You know? Right, uh, right. Uh, yeah, I think I think uh, like I said, I think Jim is exaggerating again. Right, right. So I I I understand what he's saying. You know, insofar as. So, so he has his own property. He can be on his own property, right? There's, there's no one that's going to come try other well, than and, the state. And, and the uh, in the mean, 1985 when this was written, that it's the, the government is different now than it was 30 years ago. Right. That yes, that that is that is that is a good point for modern Vanuan. Sure, of, of, mm -hmm. of course, of course. Um, but, but yeah, I I, th I think I think the difference here, uh, the the diff the main difference here is that. So he has so-called private property. He can be there. Rayo is on so-called public land the large majority of the time, if not all the time. Uh, so therefore, I guess uh, you know, with his lifestyle, he tell, like you can't trespass against the state. It's 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 essentially an own property. Uh, you know, all all good for homesteading. Um, but uh, you know, in the state's eyes, that would be you know trespassing, right? So I, I understand the point. It's it's just the the, the risk. I guess the risk analysis uh, is I think a little skewed here. Yeah, it's uh, the not only the risk, but the risk versus reward. I mean, the the positive things that Jim is talking about, right? The, the homesteading, the gardening, the the cutting trails, and, and all this stuff. Um, that can't happen in the national forest, right? It, it you know the, the the government just simply won't allow it. It it can happen on private property, but when you do these things in, in in order to get the private property, in, in order to live in the in the you know the the even a semi servile society when you own property and and you expose yourself to that coercion, it's it's about risk versus reward. Uh, rail rail believed that the that the rewards weren't worth the risk of owning property. Jim obviously believes that the rewards are worth the risk. Exactly. So. So th this is where things get uh, – so so that concludes that. So this is comments on camping by Bert in Oregon. So you want to hear a story, Jason? Sure. Hit me. What you got? All right. So so Bert and Holly put together a, uh, a a publication called Dwelling Portably. I don't know how late it went up to. The last I saw was like 1994, um, and it very well may have continued beyond that. I'm not quite sure. And for one of the new – one of the uh, – uh, in the batch of new publications, there is an, there is an edition of Dwelling Portably – uh, dwelling portably, May 1994 uh, to actually here I'm at the wrong end of this book here. May oh this is this okay this is uh, yeah May 1994 is this issue of dwelling portably, uh, and this was put together by Bert and Holly. So a couple of weeks ago, uh, actually about a month ago actually, uh, I received an email from uh, someone named Lisa. Uh, it says, uh, hi, Shane and Kyle, add swap offer, for example, 1973 Vanu Life Manual, which, uh, cutting in here, uh, we'll be publishing that uh, here soon, as I mentioned dozens of times. I'm sorry for the wait. Uh, so Vanu Life Manual 32, page uh, 8 by or 8, uh, 8 by 11, dense small type, newsprint, good condition to USPS address, $3 cut, folded for letter rate, $5 flat cash. We do dwelling portably and uh, AB zines, uh, $2, 6 for $10. Uh, and then he gives a P.O. box for someone named Lisa. And then he gives one for, uh, okay, yeah, he, he gives uh, the, the P.O. Bo box there in Alcia, uh, Oregon. 
So we've got about a, he says he's got a hundred, about a hundred copies of Dwelling Portably, found at a yard sale in 1995. Send your ad to above or Lisa Blank at yahoo.com. No displays. For more info, give a USPS address. Cordially, Bert. So I received an email from Bert, uh, from someone else's email address, and he gave me a P.O. box to send an ad to. So <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. It's like, like I emailed back to get more information because I was kind of confused. But uh, yeah, apparently wanted to do an ad swap. He's, he'd promote the Vonnie podcast. And uh, we would, uh, you know, advertise Vanu Life and uh, Dwelling Portably. So, uh, interesting. But I just thought it was hilarious. He's like, yeah, send the ad to, P to this P.O. box and I'll see you at Oregon. Like, <laughs> I've never had that request before. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things where you kind of almost forget that P.O. boxes exist. <laughs> because you're, you're so used to, to, to the modern day society of, of emails and cell phones and text and all that good stuff. But I think this is a huge opportunity. You know, uh, you should you should respond to Bert and and see, you know, first off, do the ad swap, absolutely, and then just see what else he has. Just send him send him send him a letter to PO box. Should I handwrite it? Should I you know, handwrite it too? In cursive, maybe. <laughs> oh, cursive! Oh my God, <laughs> you're, you're going you're going way back now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I I, sh I should even if not for the ad swap purposes, because I, I I don't really I, I don't really care too much about it. if it's not gonna it, I don't know how many of these publications he's selling probably not many, uh so I'm not really worried about that. I would just be interested in sending him you know a letter. Gosh, I'm sending him a letter via snail mail. What century is this? Uh, <laughs> just to see just just to start a dialogue with him. I think that'd be pretty uh pretty neat. So yeah, Bert, the guy that's gonna the guy that's uh. This is uh, the article we're going to read next, or at least the comments on, on camping by Bert. Uh, you know, he, he sent me an email from someone else's email address, uh, account, uh, email account. Uh, and apparently, you know, maybe... <laughs> I, actually, let's let's talk about LC Oregon a little bit. Okay. So, yeah, we looked at it We looked at it before uh, before the show. Do you still have that stuff handy? Uh, no, I don't. I, I closed my computer and... <sighs> okay, no problem, no problem. All right, so Alcea, Oregon. Uh, this is where the P.O. Box uh, was located. It looks like it's about uh, it's north of the. Um, it's it. It is north. Yeah, it's north of north of the Siskiyou uh, Siskiyou region where Rayo was. It's more so towards the probably middle part. Actually, not not quite middle. A little southern of middle. Uh, actually, no, northern more northern Oregon. And right next to the Swiss Law National Forest headquarters. Uh, so, and this was an interesting place to, to look up here. Uh, let me get to the Wikipedia. Yeah, the, uh, the, the nearest city of any size to it is Corvallis. Uh, that's where uh, Oregon State University is. It's, it's, a, it's a decent sized town, but it's, it's 100 miles away. Right, right. So, so this is uh, from Wikipedia. Uh, Elsia is an unincorporated uh, community in Benton County in the U.S. state of Oregon. Uh, so yeah, unincorporated community. And, uh, if you, if you look this up on a map, it looks like there's like a one main street, uh, you know, going one direction and then two, uh, I guess two, two streets on, out on, on each end that kind of, you know, separate this unincorporated community. But it's got like a, a library, a PO, a, obviously a post office and like one other thing, uh, school, I think. And, uh, that's pretty much all that's there other than houses. It's, uh, it's home to 164 people. Yeah, literally, literally the middle of nowhere. There's nothing there but, like, farmland and timber. Uh, and, and the river. And the, the Asias River. But that's it. Right, right. So very, very, you know, so yeah, very, very small. Just a little interesting detail there, you know, uh, uh, more, more geography on, uh, Oregon. So, uh, anything else, or should we go ahead and, uh, get into this, uh, this letter? No, I, I just wanted to quick say that uh, like the area in which uh, rail was at, you know, the the Grants Pass um, Cave Junction O'Brien area in southern Oregon, um, ASEA is, 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 again, what I would call a, a low coercion zone. You know, it's it's in the middle of nowhere. There's nothing major. The population is low. So the the vulnerability factor uh, the the coercion factor is very 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 low again also, right and and it's and Alcia does not have any I mean it's got a post office but there's no government there, uh, no government buildings or anything it's only 100 home to 164 people so they probably just divert to I think you said that it probably just diverts to the to the county, uh, but still the county doesn't look like there's really much there either like I don't know how big the county is but it doesn't look like there's a whole lot there so 
As far as uh, you know, choosing that location for a PO box, uh, and I would just I would think that 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 just be the location for the PO box because uh, uh, you'll, you'll find out here once we once we get to uh, to this uh, to this letter once you hear about their lifestyle. I'm not sure if they're still doing this. Uh, not quite sure. I, we we I kind of you know speculated before with Jason trying to figure out how old this guy would be. Uh, most of the stuff that he wrote it looks like started to come out uh, in the early 1980s. So that would put him 10 to 20 years younger than Rayo. Uh, so I guess anywhere from, you know, age 60 to 75, I think would be, you know, reasonable. Uh, but I, I'm not, yeah, obviously not sure. I don't really know who this guy is. So uh, uh, I was born there? in 1980. So if his stuff came out in 1985 uh, or early 1980s, I mean, that's got to put him at like a minimum 57. Um, and he would have to be like, 18 or so when he started writing to be that young so he, he's probably he's probably you know mid 60s closer to 70 years old uh probably on the north side of 70 years old yeah yeah that's 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 kind of what i'm thinking that's kind of what i'm thinking but uh let's, let's get into it uh, uh and this is uh december 1985 quote concerning the controversy over whether it's better to buy acreage or use or to use the wilderness living free number 32 page six and earlier issues Holly and I have backpack camped for eight years now full time, except for occasional short house sittings and visits with city friends. We have camped both on farms and homesteads and on open forest lands in dozens of places in Western Oregon, also in Washington and Colorado and elsewhere. And quote. So just to, I guess the the, the Vani lifestyle that they chose was backpack camping, uh, and that's what they did for you know large parts of uh, you know of, of the year, uh, you know just backpack camping. So. Kind of, I, I'm guessing the the shelter would would have just been, you know, a really high quality tent, and that and dwelling portably is where they talk about all that. I'm not sure. I I, I haven't I haven't even read that yet, but uh, I imagine it'd be more more so just camping out in tents, you know, just uh, kind of like Rayo's lifestyle. Only they moved. Uh, I would say they probably moved. They 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 probably moved for it more. Frequently. Oh, absolutely. They probably moved. I don't know. It well, yeah, it just said Oregon, Washington, and Colorado and elsewhere. So, yeah, they're pretty much all over the West is where they backpack camp. Whereas, you know, Rayo pretty much, it seems, stuck to the Siskiyou region, uh, Klamath maybe, and then uh, Bella Coola, British Columbia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They probably moved every two weeks, maybe maybe every month or so, whereas Rayo was there for uh, much longer because he talked about going all winter, uh, addi additionally in the summer, so... Yeah, right, right. So let's get back to it. Quote, both types of situations have worked out well for us. Only twice have we had disagreements with private landowners. That prompted us to move sooner than intended. And that happened many years ago when we were inexperienced with such a, uh, such arrangements. We have never had any trouble camping on open lands, including land owned or administered by forest services, timber companies, and BLM. Most of our camping on private land is well working for the owners, though we also do so occasionally to be close to town or to borrow electric power tools. At other times, we prefer public lands because there's more room to roam and less noise and because we aren't put under obligation to anyone. We once considered buying a few acres, but didn't because the advantages didn't seem worth the costs and responsibilities. Jim wrote that on land he'd bought, uh, Jim wrote that on land he'd bought, he could plant a garden or trees more freely than in the wilderness. We haven't planted much, but talking with people who have, my impression is that out in the bush and even in many rural areas, the biggest loss isn't to thieves, but to deer, rabbits, mice, cutworms, etc. No trespassing signs won't matter to them. Jim also wrote that on land he'd bought, he could be seen with less fear of bad consequences than in the wilderness. When we hike on backwoods trails, we aren't seen by many people. I recall only three in eight years. Two were hunting deer, one was gathering, uh, gathering mushrooms. If we do see someone, we say hi, maybe exchange a few pleasantries and trek on. So what are the bad consequences? No one has tried to kill or rob us. I suppose it's possible someone might, but how would our, how would our only owning the land stop them? In fact, hiking and camping on just our own few acres might jeopardize us more because people would get to know where we were uh, or get to know we were there, end quote. So, so I guess another, I guess, uh, I guess more anecdotal examples of, uh, you know, them doing the, the whole wilderness thing and not having any issues at all with, uh, with being seen, uh, not really running across anybody. So uh, that kind of goes contrary to Jim's assumption that, uh, you know, it's constant fear of being seen if you're doing the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I want to make a quick point right here about uh, they said uh, we have never had any trouble camping on open lands, including land owned or administered by Forest Service, timber companies, or BLM. Uh, BLM, uh, Bureau of Land Management. The federal government, I, I don't know the numbers in 1985, so I, I can't compare them to 1985, but today, the federal government 
or owns or manages right at about 50% of the U.S. Western land, so the, the 11 Western states. Right. Uh, like in Oregon, for example, they own they they own or manage 53.11%. So the federal government actually dictates over half of the land uh, in the state of Oregon. You know, as as, a, as opposed to New York, where right. Jim was, uh, only 0.7 percent. So, yeah, right, right, and Bert and Bert will make that uh, make that uh, I guess distinction here, or I guess maybe maybe a potential uh, you know factor will be is you know east versus west because the you know the the the, so, so the uh, supposed land ownership. Uh, is obviously much different, uh, as you said. BLM uh, over 50% in the West, and then 0.7% New York State. So uh, that that'll be that'll be another factor that he brings up. Let's go ahead and get back into it, uh, real quick. Quote: I've seen two Vonnie books, and most of most back issues of Living Free, but I don't understand why Vonnieans must never be seen. I can appreciate them not wanting strangers wandering into their camps. Neither do we, nor do most people. But when away from camp, why does being seen have worse consequences for Ava Nguyen than for anyone else? Jim wrote that road construction a mile away would compel Rayo to abandon his den. Why? Most of our camps have been less than a mile from the nearest road. Oregon, west of the Cascades, is so laced with logging roads, we'd be hard-pressed to get a mile away. And we don't make great efforts to hide our camps, though we don't call attention to them either. Yet no one has ever visit us, visited us uninvited. I assume that Rayo's den, underground is it not, would be much harder to spot than is one of our camps. Uh, we do occasionally hear logging, motorbikes, shots, dogs, etc., even if there were no roads, we'd still hear, hear, hear we'd still hear airplanes. We like solitude, but not so much. We want to move to Antarctica. Uh, end quote. So, so Bert's familiar with Vanu, which is pretty, uh, pretty, pretty neat. Uh, familiar with Vanu and Rayo. Uh, not really surprising if you are doing what uh, <laughs> if you're doing what if you're doing, if you're backpack camping and you have been for eight years, uh, you're probably familiar with uh, with Vanu. Uh, just kind <laughs> of uh, kind of a given. Uh, a absolutely, it, the the idea of Vanu, is, it, like I like I said before, you and I have conversing. The idea of Vanu is not new. What Rayo did is is really put it into words and 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 put it down on paper for others uh to others that are that are not in this this sort of um sort of niche right this, this, this sort of sort of you know freedom uh leave us alone type of niche uh it, it he, he he tried to expose it to more people is is what is what Ray did right yeah yeah he, he definitely did he definitely did um, now I, I, I do like, uh, you know, he, he makes good, he, I mean, you know, I, I like Bert's comments here. I mean, why, why do Vanillans have to be, you know, so concerned about, uh, you know, being seen, you know, as if they're away from their base camp, because I, I mean, I imagine, uh, if, if you run across somebody else, you know, that far out there in the woods, uh, there's, you, you, you can always make up a reason like, oh, I'm, I'm hunting for mushrooms or I'm hunting for, I'm foraging for food. I mean, there's, there's excuses you could come up with that would be very believable, right? Uh, so I, I mean I, I I kind of tend to agree with with Bert here that obviously you know not being seen is is, is the is the best alternative. But if you do, I mean yeah, it's, the, uh, it goes back to like we were talking about earlier the, the gray man. You know, it, you meet some guy in the woods and you're like you don't you don't want to approach them or, or whatever, but you see them and, and you make eye contact, a friendly wave. You know, hey, how you doing? You know, what's what's up the trail ahead of us? You know, how was uh, you know how how'd you guys weather that storm? simple polite conversation puts people at ease and dismisses their concerns whereas if you get you get seen and make eye contact and then you go running off into the woods right or or you get or you get angry and you start right. throwing sticks right or or whatever else that sticks in people's minds and that creates concern that creates fear a person that is fearful of somebody they run into uh in, in the middle of the woods like like that is more likely to to go to the bludgeons, to go to the government and say, "Hey, there's some guy out in the woods. He was a real dick. You guys should go check on him." Yeah, yeah, and, and plus too, I mean, from from our from last episode, uh, we kind of got an idea of where Rayo was. I mean, he could still hear highway noise in that one camp, um, that that he was at. So it doesn't seem like they were. Now, if, if if they were, you know, deep and you said a lot of it is kind of unventured, uh, you know, it's a, it's kind of uncharted territory. Uh, now, if uh, if someone ran, if, if Ray and Ray and Roberta were that far out in the woods, uh, I, I, that shouldn't even raise a concern either. Actually, uh, I mean, th but they they were, you know, close enough to, uh, they were close enough yet far enough away 
uh, to, I guess, maybe the, the interstate and some in the various towns to where, you know, the, the chance of them running into somebody were very, very slim. But then again, they might if, uh, you know, someone was hunting or uh, whatever, whatever, whatever they whatever activity they're partaking in. I mean, it's not, uh, you know, unheard of or, or extremely unlikely. Oh, ab absolutely. They, they weren't they weren't, you know, 25 miles off in the end of the wilderness. I mean, they were only a mile or two or, or even I, I wouldn't even say three miles. They, they were probably a mile or two off of the road. It's it's not unheard of to run into people out there. You know, there, there's people, you know, they, they cut their own firewood. They, they hike. They, they go hunting. They, they, they forage. You know, the, the people that live in these rural areas, the way that they live is a lot different than someone that lives in New York City. They do live a lot closer to the land. Right. They, they, they do harvest. They do grow. They do cut their own firewood, as I mentioned. So running into someone in the woods a mile or two off a road is not it's 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 not front page news to people. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So also I think Bert quells any of those concerns that, uh, you know, Jim may have had. But uh, again, I think he was kind of over exaggerating a little bit. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll, but uh, I want to move on here and get to this uh, this this next paragraph because uh, you know Bert uh, you know makes a very uh, a very uh, salient point here. Quote: I wonder if the disagreement doesn't reflect east-west differences. In most of the west, there is plenty of open land suitable for camping, but not many small plots you can buy, except near towns and along highways, and that land is expensive. In the east, my impression is it's the other way around. Uh, uh, end quote. We'll just stop there. So yeah, that's the that's the point. Um, yeah, east-west differences. It's two completely different, uh, you know, areas. Uh, and, uh, you know, e even, you know, just just between, uh, you know, like the town I live in and like a town 20 miles away, the uh, the real estate and everything is completely different. So uh, you imagine, you know, east coast and west coast. Uh, yeah, there's there's vast differences. And I think, uh, you know, from that episode with, uh, with Jeremy Hangler, uh, where we discussed uh, Jim's visit to Vanu Land, uh, I think that was the first time he'd ever really been out to the West. I mean, he 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 uh, road trip from New York uh, out there in 1971. So uh, I doubt he's too familiar with uh, with the West Coast as a whole. Yeah, the the not only the the political climate, the financial climate, but like um, the 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 land itself is is entirely different uh, out here on the West. You know, the, the Western U.S., the Western 11 states. Uh, the size of the states, number one, are are massive. Like California is huge. If you ever like, if you ever really think about it, the size of California, it will run from like New York down to Georgia. You know, if it, if it was on the East Coast, right. it's it's massive. And when you have massive states, you have massive tracts of land. Um, and and luckily here in California, buying land like close to where I am. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> you, right, you might, you right. might, you, you'd be, you, you would have as much luck as, as poop and gold. And and that's and that's probably largely due to, uh, you know, especially you know, considering all of the the so-called uh, you know public lands, the the Bureau of Land Management's uh, land, uh, you know, since they since they've claimed ownership to so much of it. Uh, that uh, I guess create is, creates uh, an artificial scarcity, uh, which would uh, you know make those prices skyrocket, and, and also too just the uh, the highly dense populations in you know Los Angeles and San Francisco and things that would have an have an, have, have an impact. Well, oh, absolutely. You know, uh, here in the state of California, the federal government owns or, or manages uh, manages as they say, uh, forty five point three percent of the state. So, the other half is is either large urban areas. Um, uh, government owned or or government control, or, sorry, local government owned or local government controlled, or is it's the farmland in the middle of the valley? Right, right. And that seems like a really, really good way to uh, push people into rural areas. Just have the BLM arbitrarily claim ownership of uh, of uh, all that amount of land, and then what choices do you have? I mean, most people can't afford, uh, you know, the the land at that price. So uh, what are they stuck doing? They're probably stuck, uh, you know, renting in Los Angeles or San Francisco or or someplace like that. So as far as a strategy for government, you know, uh, I guess get uh, get all the slaves, uh, you know, rattled up into cages. I mean, that seems like a really, really uh, good way to do it. Uh, you know, thinking uh, thinking the fairies. Oh yeah, it's, it's easier it's easier to control corralled people than it is to control free people. Exactly, exactly. So let's, let's uh, move forward here. Quote, whether on land you've bought, land you've rented, or open land, camping offers many advantages, along with disadvantages, of course, compared to building a house or cabin or uh, bringing in a mobile home. 
Attractions for us include easy changes of scene, more choice of locations, more natural surroundings, and more privacy. But the bo bottom line is very low cost. Jim mentioned needing to work only 20 hours a week. We need to work only five hours a week, uh, only uh, five hours a week about each. That's averaged over a year. Actually, we work only one or two months a year usually, but put in 40 to 50 hours a week then. Working on farms, the pay is low, but we clear more than we did at factory jobs, uh, factory and office jobs where there was rent or commuting, taxes, convenience, foods because less time to cook, special clothing needed, etc. End quote. And that is that is the Vanu life. I mean, when, when Ray talked about import, import and export, uh, he talked about uh, you know living out, uh, you know whether it's van nomadism, you know minimal sailboating, uh, whatever strategy is you pursue, uh, the goal would be to, you know, live on whatever live whatever way you, you want to live you know, 80% of the time or however much you can get to. And, uh, you know, one, two, three months out of the year, go back to the state of survival society and, uh, and, uh, export that labor, uh, you know, for those few months, get what you need. And, uh, these lifestyles are so much cheaper, so much more affordable than, uh, your typical, I guess, uh, your typical suburban family and all of the expenses that come with that. So, uh, you know, Bert and Holly, they were definitely doing, you know, what Rayo, uh, what well, Rayo absolutely. They, uh, uh, they, they, they mentioned here, you know, working on a farm for for two months migrant farm workers do this all the time i mean that this that they, they 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 pick crops for for a month or, or six weeks or, or two months or whatever the harvest uh the harvest window is and then they move on to somewhere else and do it and they they do pay less taxes they they do have more freedom than someone that is attached to an area via land or, or you know, a, a forty-hour-a-week job and things like that. Uh, in addition to that, you know, put it in forty-five hours, forty to fifty hours a week for a month or two, right? If, if you break that down, for for example, you know, you break that down to ten to ten dollars an hour. Well, you're working, you know, five hundred dollars a week for two months. You're looking at what, like four thousand dollars? No, that's not right, is it? Uh, I want okay. well, I, I it, math. Either way, either way, <laughs> uh, a tent, a couple of backpacks, you know, some sleeping bags, uh, some survival gear. That is a lot cheaper than paying a thousand dollars a month for rent over and 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 over. And, over. Yeah. and plus plus property taxes and and maintenance and all the things that come with uh, with with owning property. Right, and 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 then and then of course, yeah, and then of course you have to have the utilities and and all that good stuff too. Right. Yeah. So the, the cost of living is so much cheaper, uh, you know, with, with these sorts of lifestyles and what you've already covered, uh, I think, in probably the, uh, the the first episode of season two, the financial independence episode uh, where, you know, uh, we, we, Kyle and I really argue that, I mean, you don't have to be rich to do this. Actually, it's probably easier if you aren't rich. Well, I, I, I guess it, it's kind of debatable. But, uh, you know, if you have a lot of money, you don't have to export your labor at all. I mean, that's that's great. If you're, uh, if you're rich and you can just buy, buy a yacht and just go sail around and not have to worry about money. That's great. That that uh, definitely is great. Um, but then uh, you know if, if if you're if you're that rich, you, you got uh, other issues with taxes and things that uh, you know someone you know working a few months out of the year uh, at a uh, you know at at some sort of temporary job or uh, you know a seasonal labor, uh, you know they don't have they don't really have to worry about that. And I think one one advantage too that uh, Rayo mentioned was if you're working on a farm, a lot of times you can get paid in food, uh, and you can either you know keep keep some of that and sell some of it, or you can do whatever you want with it. Uh, and you can avoid taxes that way too, where, you know, it's just, uh, you're getting, you're, you're just, you're just getting food. You're not actually getting, uh, you know, money per se. So I think that's a, another advantage there too. Absolutely. You can take that money and take it to a farmer's market or, or, you know, you can advertise it, you know, they got Craigslist now and, and you can advertise on Facebook, online, social media, things like that. There's, you know, digital, um, uh, uh, want ads in, in the newspapers things like that. Like if, if you were to do that today, and and you got paid in food, it would not be oh, no. hard to sell it, not at all. No, definitely not, not. at all. Definitely not. So, so I, there definitely definitely some advantages there. Uh, now I don't know if he's uh, okay. Yeah, he's gonna get some disadvantages maybe here. So let's uh, let's get to a quote. Many people try camping but have an unpleasant time because of insufficient or inappropriate equipment or inexperience and conclude that camping necessarily means hardships, discomforts, and inconveniences. Not so. We've been as comfortable camping as we have ever were living in apartments. There have been unpleasant moments, such as an expected rain while moving, but every dwelling uh, dwelling way has its problems. In a house or apartment, the electricity may go off, uh, the furnace breaks down, the pipes freeze, the frame eaten by termites, etc. End quote. So, 
Uh, so yeah, I mean, this that'd be a, a disadvantage if you're trying to relocate relocate to to somewhere else, and you know it starts a torrential downpour, uh, especially if you don't have a, you know a roof over your head or anything. Um, you know that would be one disadvantage I would imagine. Uh, it seems like the places they went, the temperatures were were rather uh, mild, um, especially the the PO box that uh, that I mentioned. Uh, I think that it was like 60 degrees was the, the average highest temperature, and 42 was a low. Uh, so very, you know, mild climates. We don't have to deal with extreme highs or extreme lows. Um, but yeah, it's just it's just a different lifestyle. It's a, just definitely a different lifestyle, uh, and one uh, I would say even more mobile than uh, than what Rayo's was. Mindset is is what really comes to mind. Is these people had the mindset that this is what they wanted to do. This is what they enjoyed. They enjoyed being in the wilds. They enjoyed sleeping under the stars. Right. They they enjoyed. The, the solitude, as, as they mentioned earlier, and uh, uh, having rain when you're moving camp, it happens. It's it's it, it's just something you deal with. It's it's like dealing with a flat tire right, on the way. Right. You're not you're not going to melt. I promise. Uh, just gonna deal with deal with deal with a little rain there and <laughs> and, and move on. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I guess one other one other potential, uh, and and this is something we didn't even. Well, I guess Rio didn't even offer back. Uh, I think backpacking as as really even an option in, in Bonnie Book One. But then again, he mentioned uh, strategies like that in other articles. But um, yeah, we didn't even cover that in season one or, or yeah in season two, which uh, I guess we can we can still uh, you know keep that in on the schedule, uh, you know, with with what uh, Rayo's offered. But yeah, I guess I, I guess one of the one of the I guess difficulties might be. I mean, you can only carry so much on your back. Uh, so I don't know. I, I'd really be curious if they had something similar to what Rayo had, where they had like a chosen five spots they like to went, like they'd like to go to, and they had food storage at each of those places. I, I'd I'd really be curious to find that out, and maybe I'll maybe I'll, I'll, I'll glean some insight into that uh, once I read and digitize that dwelling portably. But we'll, we'll have to see. Uh, the idea of caches, um, it's. I I can almost guarantee these people had caches uh, at different places. They had to. They had to. Um, yeah, because because the the equipment that you would use in Colorado is not the same that you would use on, on in coastal Oregon, right? The you know winter winter camping is different than summer camping. You're not going to carry a four season tent. Uh, you're not going to carry the weight of a four season tent. You're not going to carry zero degree sleeping bags in summer, because because you're you're simply it's it it's too much weight. Uh, for the product, you don't need a, a four season tent in the exactly. summer. Yeah, so so they they had to have those those uh, those they they had to utilize those caches. Then there's just there's no way around it. Uh, not unless they were like really masochist and really just you know ounces equal pounds, pounds equal pain. <laughs> well, I don't know if you do it for eight years. I mean, I mean, uh, if you do it for eight years, I mean, um, you know, maybe it would get easier. But still, you can't you can't carry. You know, if they're out there, if if they're out, uh, you know, doing the backpacking out in the middle of nowhere for eight months or ten months or however long it is, I mean, you've got to have a lot of supplies. So, I don't see how they could get around. I, I, I yeah, I'd, even even if they were that masochistic, where they 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 really you know wanted that pain, uh, I, I still don't know how they would do. They would haul that stuff. I just I just don't see it. <laughs> uh, I, I don't see it. No, they they. they caches and 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 friendly people they, they they mentioned uh uh staying in apartment people's apartments or or house sitting it wouldn't take much to just hey you know we'll we'll watch your house for free if you allow us to you know put a couple things in your closet you know this we we, we got this we got this 55 gallon drum full of supplies you mind if we stash it in exactly the yeah and, and yeah and they did mention that they've got people's they, they, they stay at people's houses or apartments you know every, every you know maybe a, a month or month or two out of the year um so yeah i mean you work out a great agreement with 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 one of your friends i mean hey you, I mean, if if someone asked if I had you know of a new and friend that uh, you know, they said, hey can I toss this into your into your storage room in your basement? I don't do anything with it. Yeah, why not? Why not? So I, I'm sure they had no issue, uh, you know, finding people even if it wasn't uh, you know cached out in the wilderness to, to find places to put that, uh, you know, having friends. Uh, yeah, I, I guess that's another possibility too. Yeah, <laughs> I, I could only yeah. They, it, there's there's no other way around it. They have right, to. Right. Right. Okay. So I'm I'm gonna skip that last paragraph. It's an advertisement for publications um but uh this next one this this final publication uh, or final article uh for this evening is uh comments for bert from jim stump so we get to hear from jim uh quote regarding gardens being eaten by varmints that seems to be the major problem in the boondocks as i have found out for myself 
It's not that way in urban areas where I never have that problem. Uh, the solution is to put a fence around the garden. But if you do that on public land and the bludge, bureaucrats, forest police, whatever they are called, find it, they will at least break down your fence and may harass you for putting it up. Regarding being seen, Venuans are not directly concerned with being seen by civilians and not much worried that they might be robbed or killed by private criminals. Their main concern is that they don't want to be seen by bludge or by civilians who will squeal and reveal their presence to the bludge. Why? Venuans want to live free. That's primary. Their strategy for gaining max political freedom is, the, is that the government won't, can't oppress you if they don't even know you exist. So the idea is to live out of sight and mind of those who might coerce you, meaning mainly government bludge. Venuans want to disappear from mainstream society, from mainstream society which they consider unbearably oppressive. Ray oft, of, often refers to it as slave society or that society spoken contemptuously, but they pay a high price for this invisibility, and I suggest in LF that the benefit may not be worth such a high price, at least not until USA becomes. Uh, <laughs> and I suggest in LF that the benefit may may not be uh, worth such a high price, at least not until the United States becomes a much worse police state. Uh, end quote, real quick, and I put an emphasis on that in the publication. Uh, only I don't typically do that, but. Uh, you know, I bold, I, I, I uh, you know, put in bold until the U.S. becomes a much worse police state because uh, since 1985, uh, what do you think, Jason? It got a little worse. Um, <laughs> hell yeah, yes. I remember, um, you know, stories from my parents and their friends back in the 80s. You know, they would drive like th there'd be times when uh, you know, uh, you know, t teenagers would uh, you know drive drunk and the cop would just pull them over and say, "All right, no more drinking. Drive on home, there, kid." Uh, or you, like you get out of the car and you you know shake the officer's hand. You can't do that today. Uh, oh no, you can't. Uh, so yeah, even even just since the 1980s, yeah, things have gotten quite a bit worse. And I, I put special emphasis on that because uh, so kind of just begging the question. So uh, you know, is it is it worth it now? Is it worth it now? What do you think? Uh, absolutely. I think it is not only absolutely worth it now, but I think it's it's really the only way to be free. Is, is to do this Vanu thing. Right, right. So so I, I put a special emphasis there, and I guess a couple other points here, uh, you know, from the first two paragraphs. So at least he acknowledges that Von Vanuans are not directly concerned with being seen by civilians. So um, he actually, he, at least he kind of acknowledges that, uh, and, and he is correct, the, the idea is to remain invisible from, from coercers, ma meaning mainly government, um, and also civilians who will, uh, you know, go tell mommy and daddy that there's a bad man in the woods. Uh, or, or however you want to put it. So you know, I think I think he's right there. I don't really have any any issues with um, with what he with, with 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 anything he said there. No, absolutely not. I I agree completely. Okay. Anything else? No, I'm good. All right. Uh, so the last uh, the last paragraph here. Quote: I'm only speculating when I say Ray would abandon his underground den if a road was built as near as a mile away. I mean, a road with some traffic on it. Raya wouldn't be concerned about abandoned logging roads. He uses such roads himself to get his camper back into the woods. But a new well-traveled through road would give access to outsiders, to bludge, and to hordes of good citizens who act as willing ears for bludge. His invisibility could not long be maintained if people who were wandering in the woods within a mile of their parked vehicles stumbled across his den and went off blabbing in every bar and gas station in the area, as they would about the extensive construction that some weird hermit had built, built way out there in the woods. Soon authorities would hear of it and would pay him a visit to ask him how dare he build without permission on their land. Then, at least, they would break up his construction, they bulldoze cabins built without permits on private land, and they might even arrest him for something. They need, the need for invisibility arises if you want to build something permanent, a cabin, fences, hydropower system, etc. It's less essential for a transient camper unless there's a warrant out for you. The east-west difference you note is true. Also in the northeast, even wilderness that is inaccessible in summer may be wide open to every Yahoo on a snowmobile uh, in winter. End quote. So that concludes uh, concludes that article. I'll turn it right over to you. Do you have any uh, uh, any comments on that last uh, last paragraph? Uh, no, I just I want to harken back to to the last episode we did. We talked about this, right? About uh, about uh, maintaining your invisibility in the woods and and how a, a log cabin would attract attention and and how living <sighs> As as with living with leaving as little trace as possible, um, is is the only real way to to limit your coercion, uh, or limit your your exposure, then therefore limiting your coercion, uh, when living in the woods as Rail was. Yeah, yeah, and and also too, I mean, 
And this is something, you know, if uh, I, I, you know, Jim Stum advertised Bonnie Life March 1973, so he, read, he should have read the article on Smoomins, these super, super hobos, uh, super hobos or whatever, whatever the, whatever the full, I guess, uh, extended version of that is. I don't remember off, offhand here, but Rayo specifically, you know, laid out that, uh, you know, they have a handful of locations that they go to. It's not just one. So, so if this word actually happened, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. It would suck because, you know, they, they, like if they have an underground structure there that they spend a lot of time on, yeah, that'd be unfortunate. But uh, that's why you don't put all your eggs in one basket and you have multiples of these locations. So if that does happen, then, uh, you know, go on to, go. you know, okay, that spot's, that spot's done. Move on to one of the other four or five or however many that he had. Um, it's almost, uh, so, so, so earlier on, Jim mentioned the likelihood of, uh, you know, pr so-called private property being, uh, you know, expo or expropriated for eminent domain purposes. Well, you know, the, the, the possibilities of that happening twice to a Vanuwen uh, out there in the Siski region uh, are probably far lower than, uh, than even the, uh, you know, the private, the private uh, landowner uh, with eminent domain. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, yeah, two, yeah. Two of, yeah. So if two of his, if two of his squat spots, two of, two of his, uh, you know, dens, underground dens, uh, you know, had locking roads, active roads, you know, built through that area, then he's probably doing something wrong and choosing his spots. And I don't think Rayo did a whole lot wrong. <laughs> uh, no, I, I don't think he did either. And uh, um, if, if, if as of a new one, you had multiple spots and you had multiple spots compromised, you suck as of a new one. <laughs> yeah, you're, right. You're, you're not you're not practicing gray man. You're not practicing. Uh, you're you're not you're not actively limiting your coercion. I mean, you you are really your own worst enemy at that point. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If yeah, if, if you, you might want to yeah, if you if you if two of your uh, you know Vanu uh, Vanu home bases you know get uh, get exposed by uh, by civilians or bludgies, I mean, yeah, you, you're probably not. Uh, you you might want to change your strategy there. Uh, it's kind of uh, you know just kind of what what I'll, what I'll leave it with because yeah if yeah just you're doing something wrong you're doing something wrong is I guess kind of the long and the short of it but uh, so that concludes all of the publications we're going to read today uh, so I, I guess uh, overall uh, closing thoughts there Jason just just, just to reiterate the the risk versus reward uh, aspect of of vanuism of living in the woods versus uh, private land ownership and and homesteading garden etc. Um, there's, there's no one way to Vanu, right? There, there's, there's no one way to, to limit your coercion, to, to increase your in, invulnerability. It's, it truly is a subjective, uh, thing, right? It's, it's, you know, or, or, or you feel, uh, what is best for you. And, and as for me and Shane, we both believe that having a couple acres, you know, homesteading, Leaving our neighbors alone, living in the in, in a rural area away from people, right? I mean, people people equal government. The more people there are, the more government there's going to be. If you live in the middle mm -hmm. of nowhere, if if you keep to yourself, uh, if if you're if you're a good neighbor in in time of need, people are going to leave you alone, you know. And and whereas if you live in the woods and and you keep to yourself and and you practice you actively limit your coercion. If that's what you choose to do, awesome! Congratulations, have fun. I, I wish you, I wish you the best of life, uh, and and I wish the government leaves you alone. It's the same with the same with sailboating. It's the same with, uh, you know, uh, uh, pur purposeful communities. Uh, you know, w whatever else. There's there's no one way to Vanu. No, and as Ray said, Vanu, uh, Vanu was yours for the making. Uh, so how uh, you know Jim Stum could twist that around to mean that wilderness Vanu is the only way? I really, I really have no idea. Uh, but yeah, Vanu is yours for the making. Uh, it, it really is. And uh, just because uh, you know, just because you you don't find uh, wilderness Vanu attractive, you know someone else might. And uh, you know, just because uh, Jason and I, you know, are uh, you know definitely interested in the uh, kind of the rural homesteading, doesn't mean that you have to do it either. You you can you do uh, whatever you feel is best. Uh, we're not central planners. We're not dictators. I uh, think I think think Doge were not. That would be uh, that'd be really unfortunate. Uh, <laughs> really would be. Uh, so I mean, yeah, wh whatever you feel is best, uh, you know, for for your life and your situation, then uh, then yeah, you know, uh, as he said, you know, we wish you the best of luck and you know, get in contact with us if you're pursuing any of these things. So we'd uh, we'd love to to talk to you uh, for others that may be uh, pursuing similar strategies. So uh, anything else, Jason? No, no, no. That was um, I was, that was pretty much all that I had to say. It's just. Uh... <laughs> it, it it is what you make it, you know. If if you work it, if you practice it, if you 
if if you try to limit your your uh your limit your <sighs> limit your exposure to coercion, no matter what you're doing, as long as you're not hurting anyone else, then do it. Like we 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 all we all deserve to be more free. We all need to be more free, um, and we all need to actively take a part in in limiting the ability of the government to crack down on people. Exactly, and exactly. And I guess what one one other point here, just to to kind of leave the listeners with, is uh, you know, Rayo said this too. That uh, and I'm paraphrasing. You know, what was Bonnie 50 years ago may not be Bonnie today. And what's funny today may not be funny 50 years from now. So, uh, you know, I, I'm completely, you know, aware of the fact that, you know, maybe I, I don't know, maybe some, you know, mineral, mineral or, or something will be discovered in, in the area I'm going to homestead in. And, you know, maybe a city is built up around it and that farmland is kind of, you know, repurposed for uh, for suburbs. I don't think that's likely, but, uh, you know, anything's possible. Uh, so in 50 years from now, when people start pouring in, uh, you know, if, if, if you know if they possibly start pouring in, then I'm then you know that might not be Vanu anymore, and I might have to reevaluate re- reevaluate my my uh, strategy. Uh, but again, as 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 Rayo said, a, a Vanuan is someone who is willing and able to change lifestyles as many times as possible uh, in pursuit of uh, an invulnerability to coercion. Uh, so uh, uh, so so there's that. Uh, thanks so much, Jason. It's uh, it was a good time as always, and uh, you know, looking forward to, to having you on here more. Uh, I I look forward to it too, Shane. Man, I I wish. I wish you had a bigger audience so that we could reach more people. Yeah, it'd be nice. It'd be nice. But uh, you know, if uh, I guess uh, it'll it'll take some it'll it'll take some time to grow, and uh, you know, always uh, adding new things to the website to, you know, intrigue people. I actually added this past week a page called Start Here, because uh, I realized that uh, you know uh, if someone just comes across the Vonnie podcast, uh, uh, you know, the website, there's uh, wh- where do they start? I mean, there's so much there. Uh, what you start with the podcast, the books, uh, what you, the definitions, frequently asked questions. Where do you start? So I put together uh, a Vani roadmap, roadmap of sorts, uh, vanipodcast.com forward slash start dash here. So uh, if you uh, are new to the, if you're new to the idea of Vani, uh, you know definitely uh, you know start there at that page, uh, and that also gives you a link to uh, to send to somebody, uh, you know a very good starting point uh, for you to help us, you know grow this podcast because uh, we do want to reach more people. We want to. Uh, you know, create more venuance, and we want to, you know, hopefully someday see a, a Vanu association or Vanu community come into fruition. So, uh, so yeah, if, I guess just some some closing things here. If you haven't already, make sure to uh, pick up Vanu books one and two uh, for free by clicking the free Vanu books tab available at vanupodcast.com. And, uh, you know, you can always uh, shoot us donations. Uh, we, we certainly appreciate that. We are a Crypto Preferred Podcast, uh, vanipodcast.com forward slash donate. And uh, we also have a Patreon page. You can become our first uh, and uh, receive, uh, you know, some great rewards there. Uh, in addition to the, the newest one, some Vani people, uh, which will be fictional stories uh, wherein we provide examples of an individual's potential path from a controlled schizophrenic to a practicing new one to give you guys, uh, I guess, uh, uh, I guess, uh, <laughs> <laughs> concrete example through fiction to give you an idea of, of how, how someone's lifestyle could be uh, you know ranged uh, in, in the pursuit of a nuance uh, so that link is patreon.com forward slash bonnet uh, so yeah share the podcast around with your friends family and uh, you know all of our social media all over your social media accounts uh, we sure appreciate it that's all we have for you thanks so much and we'll talk to you next week